Of course. Well, thank you so much, Jamie, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Hope you're having a nice day at Aspen and Ideas Festival. I'm very happy to be joined by two of the foremost um, thinkers and experts on the internet in China, and I mean that genuinely. Uh, Michael Anti is a well-known blogger in China, one of the most famous bloggers in China, um, whose words, I know who, now I know who my comrades are, are the title of Emily's book. So they have a very interesting history together. But he has articulated both the um, opportunities and challenges um, and possibilities of the internet uh, better than just about anyone in China. And now uh, Michael works for Saijing Media. He's in charge of innovation and is one of many, many Chinese who are pursuing startups in China. Um, Emily Parker um, is a digital diplomacy advisor for the New America Foundation. She previously was an advisor for Secre Secretary of State Hillary Clinton um, in her policy planning staff. Um, and she is the author of this book, which is really uh, for anybody who wants a, a sense of the history um, of the internet in China and, um, and the promise and peril of it is just a must read. So uh, thank you both for joining me. Uh, Michael, I will also say that you flew in from Beijing last night. You're grappling with jet lag uh, right now. Um, why don't we get it started? Could you give us your sense of you know, the, the title of this uh, panel is, is, is what's happening with freedom of expression in China? Under Xi Jinping, there's a widespread belief that, that it's eroding. Is that true? I think. I think one uh, once the phrase to describe the situation now in China, not only the freedom of speech, but also economy, politics, anti-corruption, or anything else, is just called new normal. Mm -hmm. That means we just ha a bunch of new things happen, and people just accept it as the new normal. So you you can read the new normal as the title in, the, in Chinese newspapers, but also new, read newspapers from the and the foreign coverage is about China. I think in the matter of the freedom of speech, I think because internet is already being very in the center stage of Chinese society, so when they talk about freedom of speech, basically we can almost say it is about internet freedom. Internet freedom and freedom of speech and freedom of press, I think uh, was, uh, were literally shrinking um, after the Xi administration. I think uh, I, I can give you some timeline, timeline about that. So it's the early, early months of the 1913s, uh, she came into power. So, but then the two days is very important for the internet policy change. The June the 20th, June the 20th, 2013, mm -hmm. is Snowden you know, case. Mm -hmm. Snowden flew to Hong Kong then to Moscow. And uh, all the data to show was once the, end, the guiding angel of the internet freedom, I mean the United States government, was actually did the, exactly the bad thing. For example, they're monitoring civilian you know, citizens and the foreign leaders mm -hmm. and do the hikers. So from that date, internet freedom as an agenda disappeared. Globally, mm -hmm. so when uh, um, American uh, politician or dip diplomat visit Beijing, no more discussion about there is no no discussion no more discussion about freedom of speech, internet freedom, and more about cyber cyber attack because cyber attack is more like to you know nation state to prevent the new war happen. It's not about I'm standing in the, the high stand of the moral to, to criticize you. So Snowden. It's a very important case in China that they just told the Chinese government from now on, it's just you're free to go, free to do anything you want because there's no more anger in the world. So right after that, in September of 2013, there is new internet law happened, the issued that is about anti-rumor internet law. Basically said, if you criticize the local government, or criticize the government, and the government think it's not true, if your post was reposted by more than 300, well, 500 people and viewed by 4,000 4, uh, people, you will be in jail. Mm -hmm. So I just give you the numbers of Chinese internet users is 600 million. So 600 million versus 500, nothing. So basically say, 
this new law gave the government a blank check to arrest any bloggers they want. But even this very strict law happened, they arrest lots of journalists, they crack down almost every week, but there's no very big response from the war stage. Why? Because the United States also in a crisis is about the moral crisis. Snowden blamed them and all their so that's the thing happened is really, and I, I, I really remember that days after the Snowden, after the, suddenly no more talk about internet freedom. Mm. Before that, I, every time people invited me, we'd always talk about the internet freedom mm. thing, but then all the invitation just retreated because how can you say, I, before in American government, like, Hillary Clinton had a very big speech about internet freedom. I was invited to attending. It is very good, but after Snowden, there's no more because, you know, you are also not good, so mm. why not? Mm. So this is a very important um, timeline. But after that, you can see, you know, weeks after weeks crack down the journalist and the, Weibo, the celebrity bloggers in the, in the social media Weibo, they just uh, shut, shut the mouths up because it's very dangerous to continue to criticize the government, no, whatever is the local and the, and all the center. It doesn't matter because mm -hmm. just criticize. But this is the one side of the story. That means crackdown, they just silence everything. But also we have other things. That means Chinese journalists and the bloggers, they not only have the threat, facing the threat from the government, from politics, but Oh, I can say more seriously, threat is not from government, it's from the internet per se. Mm. Because China before, the celebrity bloggers, the best bloggers, actually they are journalists. They use the internet as a platform to criticize society, criticize the government. But they are journalists, they have a very good living by the career. But after the internet, social media, almost literally destroy the career and the industry of the journalism, so a blogger, a journalist, think is very, very, now has no money mm -hmm. to live. So I, I think that's where, for a Chinese, is more fundamentally to shut your mouth up. Emily, um, do you agree with that assessment, that in a sense that Snowden and uh, this sudden, suddenly there's no expectation of privacy in China and around the world has almost made freedom of speech in China, we're, we're, we're almost past that. And, and the yeah. authorities are, are, are worried about other things when it comes to the internet. Yeah, well, it's hard to argue with, with any of that. I think that on the Snowden point, I don't think Snowden necessarily changed how the Chinese authorities handle the internet. It more changed how the US can talk about internet freedom, and it changed some of the rhetorical points about internet freedom, but I don't think China would have a free internet if it weren't for Snowden. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that. So just putting him in the, in the right category. But I think, yes, um, well, first of all, you have to look at it in perspective because I've always been somewhat more on the optimistic side about the Chinese internet in that I do think it is providing a platform for unprecedented freedom of speech in China. Now, I, you have to hedge that statement, right? That does not mean it's creating perfect freedom of speech in China. It means it's creating much more freedom of speech in China than ever before. Now, over the years, I've been covering China and the internet since 2004, which is when Auntie and I met. Over the years, I've been asked about that countless times. It's, well, this is the greatest crackdown on internet freedom in China. This year is the greatest crackdown on internet freedom in China. It's gotten more and more intense as years have passed, and now you're hearing that same language again. This is the worst environment for the internet in China. However, the th important thing to keep in mind is that the authorities' crackdown is generally commensurate with the increasing power of the internet, right? So as the internet power grows, as they see what people can do, as they see how people are using the internet to organize, and again, the number that Auntie just said, 600 million, that's why the government is worried. The Chinese government would not be cracking down on the internet if the internet wasn't powerful, right? So that's kind of an important point. Now, what we are going to get into as well is one, one thing that I've always thought about and what inspired me to write my book is that 
we always talk about the internet in China in terms of freedom of speech and freedom of information. That's always how the Western media portrays it. It's, you know, China censored this information and these brave Chinese netizens found that information. It's always about that. And if you talk about the internet in China in only those terms, you're probably going to come to a conclusion that the Chinese government is winning. You know, as Auntie just said, you can't really argue that everybody in China knows what's going on. The censorship in China is really formidable, and in some ways, it's getting worse. It's getting worse uh, in, in terms of a crackdown on criticism. But the point that I, I'd like to make is that I actually think that the power of the internet in China does not lie in freedom of speech, but in freedom of assembly. And that's where the internet in China has the potential to be transformative. And that is why authorities are so worried about the internet. If you look at what authorities crack down on, yes, as Auntie said, they definitely crack down on criticism and they're doing that more and more. But the real red line is collective action. It's not criticism. It's not, I don't like the government. I don't like this guy. I mean, they don't like when you criticize. Don't get me wrong. But the thing that will really get you in trouble is saying, why don't we all meet in this location? Or why don't we all band together in order to take action to do this? That is what is really, really threatening about the internet in China. And the thing to remember about China is that if you are a dissident or if you're even just somebody with an agenda that's not that the government doesn't like, there are not a lot of public places where you can gather peacefully. This is, not, this is not the way China works. So it's really significant that the internet offers a platform for hundreds or thousands or even millions of people to gather and to organize. Even if it's only virtual, that space did not exist in China before the internet. Michael, you were talking earlier when we spoke about how this is playing out on the ground. Um, we have Liu Wei in the very powerful information ministry, which is, uh, with some media groups, um, actually taking an active role in sponsoring them. Um, and other media groups, as you said, journalists are simply losing their jobs. Has the internet then become, become in a sense, um, almost the principle in China, replacing the, the, the party knows that it almost needs to replace itself because the internet has become so strong. I, I think is a, the, the role of the internet to Chinese society is very similar to the market in, in the time of 1970 and 1980s. So I, I, you remember when the, before Deng Xiaoping opened up, so the plan to, uh, at the beginning of Deng Xiaoping opened up China in 1978. I think a lot of you listen, you heard a lot of the argument about whether the market will open up China and to you know, really bring China into the democracy or whether or not. I think in the big debate also there. And, and the United States was very excited about Deng Xiaoping, you know, visit, China, visit the United States. And, uh, but actually, the Communist Party survived of the, all the market thing. Now, you, you see almost like, you read the news about AIB, the new bank that China is in charge of, then even the UK and Germany was invited yeah. to do, to, to join. I think he really, the Chinese government, adapt themselves into the new game, know how to control, the, utilize the new, new thing, new tools, the market the, to benefit them. So I think the internet is the same thing. When the first, uh, it's exactly like the market. Market is Deng Xiaoping initiative. That, but also the internet from very beginning in China is also the government one internet. And then the citizen thing it is a very good vehicle to expand civil society. But now the Chinese government have passed the learning curve. They say, okay, I know how to control the internet. And now even I can invest that and sponsor the internet, utilize the internet in our way. But still, you, you can see it's like the market. But what my argument is, I, I second Emily, I think we should understand market and internet is the only two best thing in China for Chinese people. Market and the internet. Without these two things, I think we are just like Syria and North Korea <laughs> or other <laughs> things. So that means well, outside internet and the market, there is no such normal thing before internet. For example, you, you may think that internet represents some kind of freedom of speech, but you have normal thing. You have election, you have freedom press, you have very mainstream media. You also have their very powerful industry, you know, entertainment industry, right? And also uh, the community. But China lack of that before the internet. 
So internet is almost everything. From the internet, we have the Taobao. We have the WeChat as to communicate to each other. We have Taobao. Taobao, that means Alibaba, to buy everything online. We also have the Weibo, mm -hmm. to, it's the copycat of the Twitter. We know things, get the information. So internet is almost like the combination of New York Times plus Hollywood plus the yeah, all the best thing, you know, in an election, and also the TV. So this is a combination. So, so internet, and also the eBay and, and the Amazon. So Don't forget the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the Wall Street <laughs> Journal, yeah, it's very important. And you are only money, the difference between New York Times and you. So I, I would argue, and I agree with Emily, that when you talk about the internet freedom, actually we should more talk about the freedom of everything. Because internet is the foundation of the Chinese society. When on one side, the internet freedom in the political way is shrinking, shrinking, but the internet freedom in other way, for example, it's easy to buy things, to easy to go abroad, to easy financial freedom. I think it gets increasing. Mm -hmm. Emily, could you talk about um, two services in China, Weibo and WeChat, as just sure. examples of how these tensions are playing out? Um, Weibo is, 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 is really the subject of an intense crackdown. Mm -hmm. um, but WeChat is, is, uh, is, is, is something in terms of the freedom of assembly that, that yeah, is a game changer. Definitely, sure. So quickly, I agree with everything that Auntie just said. And I think you know, part of the problem here is that we, and the Western media, I probably take some of the blame for this here, you know, we set up this kind of false question, which is, will the internet, what, will the internet create a change of government in China? Like, I don't know why we were asking that question, because the internet on its own doesn't topple governments, right? So people say to me, well, how, when will the internet transform China? How come the internet hasn't transformed China? And it's, the internet has already transformed China. You know, like, yes, everything Auntie is saying is true. The government is using it to its own advantage advantage, it has its limits, but that doesn't mean it hasn't had a transformative effect in other ways. And that brings me to your question. Um, you know, one of the most, people always ask about the Western, Western companies in China, Google, Facebook, Twitter, you know, why none of them have really succeeded that well. And well, Facebook and Twitter are, are blocked. Um, one of China's probably most brilliant strategies is not just blocking these, these sites, but creating really vibrant domestic alternatives. Mm -hmm. So that's actually, you know, and I went to China recently and I was amazed at, it really felt like every single person, every single person in China was using WeChat. And if you weren't using WeChat, you were some sort of social pariah, which is interesting because here in the US, the average person is not aware of WeChat at all. So it's like these two totally different information universes. We have you know, the US kind of on Facebook and Twitter, and then you have China on WeChat, which is much more localized, has really cool features, and everybody you know is on it. So that's a really effective way to keep people sort of on the local networks. But the, you know, the difference between Weibo and, and WeChat and Twitter and Facebook is that the Chinese versions are censored. They're heavily censored and they're monitored and surveilled. But people still make the choice to use them because they're more convenient, they're more adapted to the Chinese environment, and they have cool features before we do in the, in the US. So you might be able to talk more specifically about them. But. Yeah, with WeChat, it's kind of amazing. Uh, people willingly give their, their names, yeah. their, their, their friends, their, 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 you know, their dating partners. It's just like the new normal, right? Yeah, yeah. This, is the, this is the amazing thing that we were talking about this this morning about WeChat is that, you know, I, that was what struck me in China is that I would talk to people who were, you know, former dissidents or were dissident minded or you know Americans who media critics living in China and they were just using WeChat and basically it's very simple you know you give them your cell phone number you give them all your contacts you tell WeChat where you're going all the time they were doing this voluntarily which I think is just an interesting aspect of this kind of new normal psychology yeah, I, I think it's just, actually I think the China new normal will become the new normal of the United States and the globally because we already know there is surveillance. We everyone know every sentence we are writing and talking will be surveilled and monitored by the government. We already know thousand years ago, right? <laughs> so, but the problem, the United States have your people has an illusion. You thought your privacy were protected. The government will never surveil mm. and monitor everything you said. But Snowden just tell you no. NSA did the exactly almost same thing as the government, maybe more clever thing. So, actually, this is a universal question mm -hmm. about the privacy. 
It's not only China, just like me, I'm a little bit sometimes criticized government, but I also I use the WeChat. But sometimes I raise the question, when the WikiLeaks happened, I raised the question to my friend. WikiLeaks, Dan Snowden. So mm. almost everything you can't keep secret eventually will put in the public. So if you cannot put it in secret, how can you behave here? This is a psychological questions, right? So China is the test, mind, mind test lab. Basically you say, when you enter China, there is no secret at all to the government. How can you behave here? Can you still fight for the freedom of speech without all the civilians, without everything you said was disclosed by the government and in the public, everything said will put you in danger? But people in China are still fighting for the freedom. So it's not really, it's the, because we think if this is new normal, if this is the fact, we cannot just avoid that. We just come from that. So when this come to uh, the new things, question to the United States also, if eventually NSA or the government is surveying everything, or eventually everything you said will be in public, why not? We still fight for the freedom. Freedom is worth in fight, even everything is in public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess in China you just don't really have much of a fight for privacy. <laughs> yeah, That's we, a, a losing battle. Yeah, privacy is actually is not really uh, even a question because privacy is broken hardly, and you know. Yeah. In China. So that's that's we, the difference. It's like, yeah. Yeah. Emily, could you talk about um, the experience of first meeting Ante many sure. years ago, uh, and um, and what you, drew you to him, and and um, and Ante, you're free to pipe in. Sure. So, um, yeah, it's so funny. I'm always talking about Auntie, which is funny because he's now sitting right here, so <laughs> I'll do that less. But, um, but yeah, I mean, Auntie actually was, was really, um, in many ways, the inspiration uh, behind this book because, and it's very much ties into the questions that we're talking about. In 2004, when I was working for the Wall Street Journal and my editor said, oh, why don't we do something about China and the internet? And my initial reaction was like, uh, first of all, it was kind of a niche story back then. It wasn't, which is hard to believe, but it didn't. It wasn't immediately clear that this was going to become as enormous and a phenomenon as it is now. But I remember talking to other journalists, really smart journalists in China hands, and they would say to me, yeah, the internet in China is kind of interesting. You have 100 people there, a few hundred people there getting around censorship. But like, ultimately, what's the point? Because the, the censorship is stronger, kind of what we're saying now. And I, so I said, all right, well, let me at least go to Beijing and sort of see what this internet story is all about. And that's where I met, met Auntie. And you know, Auntie at that time was probably a little more optimistic <laughs> about mm. the power of the internet uh, in China and was really kind of telling me about how important it would be and what a game changer it would be. So I was, um, I taught Auntie the concept of devil's advocate. <laughs> so I was pushing him and I was like, well, um, okay, you're saying that it's gonna transform China, but they're censoring and w why does it really matter? And the answer that he gave, which actually became the title of my book, is because now I know who my comrades are. And to me, that was such an interesting concept and, and Auntie can describe it better than, than I can, but the idea was, you know, before the internet, if I disagreed with the party or I disagreed with the government, I'd have no way of knowing that there's other people in the country who think like me. No way. And it was only kind of on the internet that he discovered other people that were kind of in his ideological camp. And that was a transformative uh, process for him. And I think it's fair to say that this guy that you're seeing right here wouldn't exist without the internet in your current form. You'd be a completely different person. And so I, I just found that that a really interesting idea. And then, you know, I started traveling to other countries and hearing s people saying the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Auntie, we were talking before about fast forward to Beijing now, which is one of the hottest startup scenes in the world, um, really uh, rivaling, you know, obviously under Silicon Valley, but, but growing very quickly. Has innovation and startups and VCs in a way, um, have they replaced um, freedom of speech and democracy and some of the earlier um, kind of allure of the internet. Um, China's government is really embracing technology. Yes, I, I think it's a, we, we, when they talk about Chinese internet, we should always remember two rankings. First is about freedom ranking. I think China is, a, is very, very behind. It's close to Syria and North Korea, right? It's a, the most serious the sense of the internet in the whole world. It's another great firewall, very strong. But at the same time, 
in matter of the innovation, China is also, according to Ernst and Young, is also number two country. Number two country. But, I mean, number one is the United States, of course. Number two is China in matters of innovation and all the VCs, VC, the hotbed of the, the VC investing. And even, even larger and more vivid than the Europe, than the Germany, than UK, than France. Mm -hmm. So this is a two picture at the same time. At the same time, it's very censored the internet, really censored. And also, they have this, I, saw, I call it, I just mentioned, it's, it's, it's clone and copy and clone, uh, block and clone the <laughs> policy. Basically, I block the original one, I copycat the, the one. You have the Baidu, I have, I will, you have the Google, I have Baidu. You have Facebook, we have, we have the, we, uh, the Renren WeChat. Right. Then you have the Twitter, we have. We, we copycat everything. This is the thing, but also we have new things. It's about innovation. For example, the Premier just has their very national pl internet plus, the plan for the whole country. Literally, now, the, if you talk about you know, very famous bloggers, you know, five years ago, all the bloggers now become start, start, start -ups. startups. Start -upper. Yeah. Start -upper. Yeah. It becomes startups. Bloggers now become new startups. Yeah, this is the, the thing. I, how can you describe the, the, the different picture in one hand, uh, in the one side? I think I can say it's a new social contract. Mm. That means basically they say, he said, internet is an amazing thing, but the government wants to control. So he ha has a proposal about new social contract. You just shut your mouth up. And I give you a way uh, some way of exist to the economic way. For example, it's get more easier, more easy to have a, your own company in China, and also it's very welcome. Local government essentially going to welcome all the VCs and the angels and all the startups to do the new things. So innovation almost become the hottest word in China recently. But this is the picture censored, very sensitive speech and press, but all, well, on the other hand, innovation, very hard. And also funny things, you know, we talk about media shifting, media transition, because media is dying. Who is the most biggest sponsor of the new media you know, transition? It's the propaganda department. You know I mean, internet censor, the censor become the sponsor of innovation of the media. They create a very new thing that if you can, the best new media in China actually was sponsored by the states. The government is, is the pioneer of the new media sponsor, and it's more like an angel for the innovation. It's so weird picture, but it really happened in China. So when the tradition, very liberal media group, because lack of the support of the state, mm -hmm. they are very, very backwards in the new media innovation, because their mindset and the lack of the money, but the government has the money to give the money to the, to, the, to the media and start up, they listen to the government. Mm -hmm. Emily, is this a contradiction in terms, what Auntie is, is sketching out? You have innovation on the one hand and strict censorship on the other. In the West, we would say, well, how can that go hand in hand? If you're a yeah. startup, if you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to innovate, are you gonna be ramming into, into walls or lines that you shouldn't cross? I think that's the question. That's the big question. Can this really work over the long term? Because I think, yeah, the conventional wisdom is that innovation needs freedom of, you know, freedom of information. And of course, you hear anecdotal stories all the time about, you know, researchers who couldn't get the information they wanted or academics who had trouble finding things on the internet in China. And, and um, and how this is a barrier to creativity. I think you know this is something that we're going to have to see how it plays mm -hmm. out. But this is happening in all parts of China. I mean, for example, with the maker movement. I don't know if you follow the you know the do-it-yourself maker movement. This is another really interesting example of when we think about the maker movement in the U.S. Even though the U.S. government does support it, we think of it as like this kind of grassroots thing. But this is this is something that the Chinese government is is part of their innovation campaign is very actively sponsoring and saying, okay, go and tinker and make and invent and and you know when you talk to makers in China they don't necessarily see this as a contradiction you know they say look in China it's impossible to do anything if the government doesn't approve so at least if they're kind of sponsoring this and they're letting us have our festivals and our innovation conferences then like let's just go with it so it's really interesting i think it's too soon to tell i mean i think there is 
I think I'm a little bit skeptical, though, about how much free innovation you could have in a highly censored mm -hmm. environment. Um, Auntie, since we're being equal opportunity here, um, and I know it was a while ago, but, but you were actually banned, I understand, from Microsoft, and that Facebook has not recognized you as a user because no. you use a pen name. Is there, is there, in your mind, a sense, and, and I, I want to talk a bit about Western companies in China, but, but do you feel that there's been a bit of a double standard here, that, that we criticize Chinese companies all the time, but Western media companies have also had their role in what's happened? I think the, the story happened to me that Microsoft removed my blog, not the government, Chinese government, removed, I, Microsoft removed my blog in 2005, was a big story in the internet because it just, it just broken people's mind. Mm -hmm. How can an mm -hmm. anger, you know, of the American company has high moral stand? It's, it just removed the blogger. And, but now mm -hmm. it already become new normal, right? It's mm -hmm. happened almost every day. Not only Facebook not removed my account, almost removed every single country to so pick up some guy's right. account. So this is a new normal things. I think I was the first, one of the first guys to understand this new normal. That means there is literally no angels. I already knew that in 2005. But my problem is, we problem is, if there is really no good guys. How can you fight for the freedom? There is no ally. So this is a really tricky thing. Google has the problem in, the Germ in, in Germany and in Europe. European guys think Google is also bad. Okay, actually, Google for me is, is the anger, but European thing. But actually, everyone, you know, everyone is bad. So if, if you, in the, in the very, everyone is a bad word, how can you behave here? Chinese government, the theory is very simple. If everyone's behavior bad, so there is no, mo no standard at all, so I act as I will. But my theory is even there is no good guy, but we also have less worse guy. Is this the English word actually wor less worse guy or something? Few worse guy? No, no, I mean. I, mean, I know what you're trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a very <laughs> weird word. It's a, but someone is less bad. Basically. Less bad. Yeah. It's less bad than the others. I think less bad. And so it's almost like a cold war, right? Mm. It's like, a, I don't think even both sides is good. I think American in the South American did very bad thing and the Soviet Union, of course, very bad. But even though for, for, for activities in a third world country, you still should think United States should be the direction on the right side of the history. Even this right side, eventually the holder is, a, is, a, is a, also a monster. Mm -hmm. But he's on the right side of history. Mm -hmm. But this, the story of Western companies in China, or US companies in China, is really telling. Because it's the same kind of thing as with the internet. When you know, these US internet companies started making moves to come into China, everybody was like, oh, this is, this is the end of, this is the end, right? These Western companies are going to liberalize everything. Chi you know, Chinese internet censorship will never survive with Google and Yahoo. And I mean, that was kind of this idea. And the, actually, what happened is, um, these, these companies did not transform China. China kind of transformed these companies, right? These companies ended up tailoring themselves to meet China's expectations. Microsoft is a prime example. You know, Microsoft shut down Auntie's blog, not the Chinese government, Microsoft, you know? And, and there's so, I mean, I don't want to pick on Microsoft because there's every US company has some sort of story like this, or most of them, right? I mean, you have Yahoo giving information to authorities that puts a Chinese guy in jail. You know, you had Google News giving a censored version of, of search results. What's interesting about it, though, is that the, West, the, comp the dilemma that these U.S. companies face is actually the critical dilemma that everybody faces in China. And it's kind of what you were talking about. It's, well, do I just take a principled stand and basically get blocked out and have access to, you know, um, uh, nobody? I can't reach the Chinese market, but I'm, I'm principled, but I'm going to stand outside of China and yell at the top of my lungs. Or do I make, you know, some little compromises in the interest of increasing freedom here you know it's a, it's everybody faces the same dilemma you know authors who write books about china mm -hmm. do they make a few 
changes in order to get their books published in China, or do they stand on principle and as a result nobody in China reads them? Right? There's not an easy answer to this question, but that's the and that's the that's the dilemma that people inside China are facing all the time, like you're talking about, you know. Do I continue writing my dissident blog and just have trouble every single day and maybe get arrested and nobody and it's gonna be blocked? Or do I start a startup, you know, and try to increase make the media more lively? Right, so and you know, not to defend these U.S. companies, but they are just making the same calculation that that all people in all different industries are making. Well, but the fact of the matter is that Facebook isn't allowed in, Twitter isn't allowed in. You know, there are companies that really want to be in China that aren't. Um, could you? Could you? Will, will Mark Zuckerberg be allowed to enter China? He badly no, he's wants to. He's really welcome because he read the English version of Xi Jinping's book. He's very, he should work on in China. But it's not about Facebook. I think China makes very clear mind, clear decision about servers. If you want to do business in China, hand over your servers. Mm -hmm. Server, whoever controls server, control everything, the, the user data. So this is the principle. So when the United States and the outside world is, is in, I think the United States people is the most, the purest people I ever see in the world. You almost everyone live in the, in the black and the white world, Andrew and the mon versus the monster. But once someone like an American step into a more you know, gray world, I think some, some American people has, have the puzzle, has confused about how, how can you handle it because there is no clear you know, 101 books or the guide to do the great things. But actually, I just mentioned the Amity pocket that is everything Chinese is visiting too. But what I said, so when the United States losing principles, when you do the complicated thing, fix the complicated things, Chinese government is very clearly about his stand. You always hand over your server when you do business in China. This is something you cannot cross over. So that's become a war. You are confusing, and China has got more and more powerful. Mm -hmm. This is the thing. It's not about moral, because I, nobody's angel, Well, the, right? other, the other thing to keep in mind here, too, is that the real dilemma for U.S. companies is that even if they compromise their principles, you know, and, and had congressional hearings in the U.S. and were slammed, all, you know, everybody was really angry, even if they did that, they still might not succeed in China. That's the thing, right? They could make these compromises, and they just would not be able to compete domestically in China because China has some very strong domestic companies, and these U.S. companies would never really win the trust of the government. So, you know, they could they could make all these moral compromises and still lose. So, it's not it's not a very attractive scenario. So, could we talk about you know, there's VPNs, there's people, you know, there's there's people who have a lot of money in China. There's people who have power. They can figure out ways around. Um, uh, sensors. Um, Emily, tell me about uh, Twitter and, and there was the case of the blind dissident at Chen Guangqing and yeah. how, how in some ways though as much as China doesn't want the Western companies with their servers outside China to play a role there are some some notable instances where they have. Sure. So that's a great question. So you know, Twitter, this whole kind of like Twitter versus Weibo thing. I mean, the conventional wisdom is that Twitter is irrelevant in China, right? Because China has its own version of Twitter with you know hundreds of millions of people. Twitter, we don't know how many people, but it could be I don't know tens of thousands. I mean, it's you can't compare because for to get onto Twitter, you have to jump over the Great Firewall. Now, it's worth noting here that it's not that hard to jump over the Great Firewall of China if you want to do it. You know, you can get a virtual private network, VPN, that VPN will probably be closed at some point. You get another VPN, mm -hmm. you know, you ask Conti, I don't know. <laughs> there, there's always a way. When there's a will, there's a way. But for most people in China, they don't really want to go to Twitter because everyone they know is on Weibo and it's, it's a kind of a pain and you're not going to reach a large audience. But I think it's important to note that Twitter does have still have an impact. How does Twitter have an impact? I think in two main ways. In one way, it's kind of a one-stop shopping for the Chinese dissident scene, right? So anybody in China, and not even dissident, but any in China who has thinks a certain way, maybe is a little bit more critical, they're likely to have a Twitter account, right? So that Twitter provides a platform for them to communicate amongst themselves, which is important. I mean, it's kind of a, they're like a Chinese opinion leaders can communicate amongst themselves without Chinese censorship because they're outside of the firewall. 
The other way that Twitter is important, and I tell this story in my book, is that if you're in China and you want to communicate directly to the Western media, there's probably no better way to do that in real time than Twitter, right? So this happened with, with Chen Guangcheng, and I'm not going to get into this whole story here, but I'm sure some of you remember um, you know, this blind lawyer when he took refuge in the US Embassy. Um, initially, the story was really portrayed in one way, that he kind of had reached an agreement and he was going to, everything was fine. And I remember I was looking at Twitter, just normal Twitter, but I follow a lot of people in China. And I started seeing these reports come through, and they were saying, everything the media reported is wrong. Everything is wrong. And these were basically Chen Guangcheng's friends, people he knew. And of course, you know, everybody is, every Western journalist pretty much is on Twitter. So they started asking these people, like, wait, what are you talking about? And within, you know, a matter of hours, the entire Western media narrative kind of was reversed. And that was what started it. And this couldn't have happened on Weibo, because Weibo, that would have been centered in two seconds. You never would have had those messages. So you know, if Auntie or one of Auntie's friends wants to say something about China and get that story to the Wall Street Journal, to the New York Times, to anyone in the US, Twitter is going to be a pretty fast way to do that. Auntie, before we open for questions, um, any thoughts on that? On that? To, you know, if, you, if you're a princeling, if you're a person of influence in China, does this whole debate matter much, or can you just leap over the firewall? I think, just, so even everyone accept uh, the new normal things. As a daily life, like the air, like the Beijing air, right? <laughs> like the Be even Beijing air is, uh, is polluted, is, I know that, I cannot escape that, but still I want to buy a purifier. Even it's very expensive, because at least at my home. In my home, I breathe very you know, fresh air. Mm -hmm. So I think the Twitter is the mm -hmm. purifier mm -hmm. of the knowledge, of the information. Even I know in whole China, I, I should get used to WeChat. I love WeChat. We love Weibo. But eventually, in your heart, you should have something very real, very direct, very no self-censor yourself. Right. I think that would be the Twitter. So Twitter is like one-stop stand to the truth. Right, and, and to your community, right? I mean, that's And also the friend that shared the same interests and right. same idea with me. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy. If you, I see someone you know, from the Twitter friend, we call Twitter friend, I just by default think he's a very good guy, mm -hmm. without doubt, because it's so hard for China to stick into the Twitter. You, if you have all the alternative, mm -hmm. the WeChat thing, if you, you know, can give up the millions of followers in Weibo and WeChat. You just want to stay in a Twitter. That means uh, the, the belief in your heart to, of the freedom is mm. so strong, I really will love you. Mm. Mm. I'd like to open it up to questions if there are any out there. I have quite a few more. Um, the woman in the, the brown jacket, here's a microphone right here. Yes, great. Well, I follow you, Michael, on Twitter, actually. So. Um, <laughs> Thanks, this is a really terrific uh, panel discussion. Um, so I'm curious, we have a new normal under Xi Jinping, and whether you sort of ascribe this change to Snowden or to Xi or to some combination of both, I guess the question I have is, is this it, right? Or do we get another new normal in uh, seven or eight years when Xi Jinping is out or maybe even before then? I mean, are there enough pressures you think that may mount from whatever set of factors that will then cause a, a change again, back mm. to a sort of more open and dynamic uh, internet? Uh, me or For both uh, of you, yeah. Okay, mm. I, I just the open first. Up. I think that the new normal thing, Chinese internet policy is very depend on the leader, top leader himself. So you can see every several years, every 10 years or eight years, you have special new policy. Because internet, especially web 2.0 internet, is so centralized. Basically, it's Beijing internet. Mm -hmm. The servers and the regulator and the, the, the sensors, actually, they're all Beijingers. So it's Beijing guys control everything. If the top leaders think we should change all the internet governance, Chinese internet governance structure into one way, the whole thing will change immediately without even delay. For example, the, in the previous administration, like Hu Jintao administration, Internet actually become a platform for bloggers as anti-corruption to disclose the corrupted official in the local government. It's, it's almost like a 
uh, unite, uh, it's, it's like combination. It's an ally, you know, it, it's almost the central government the ally with the, the bloggers to arrest mm -hmm. the local corrupt official. This is a very funny new structure of the internet governance. It just disappeared when the new leader thing came into power. When he think it's not a good thing of the regime, everything turned to the back to the normal the government versus the blogger thing. So I think if next administration, if the new guys have a new policy, I think we should uh, should you know talk about this policy again. So my point is very simple: never write Chinese internet policy into books mm. because <laughs> it's bad for the selling. Because once you finish that. Everything will have a chance. So it's so sad that Emily wrote a book about Chinese internet, <laughs> but I hope. It's not about internet policy. OK. But I tried many times about internet policy, but I really didn't. For example, I had a speech in, in 2012 about, in a TED about censorship in China. But now, actually, that kind of internet governance is about the previous government. It's not the present one. Well, now we get, have the pleasure of hearing your thoughts uh, now in 2015. Emily, is it time to write another book? Is enough change? Um, so actually, I mean, I think that, uh, of course, you know, I, this is a self-serving argument, but <laughs> I think the book stands. Um, you know, mm -hmm. my book, I, I think Auntie's right. The, the nice thing about writing a book that spans 10 years is that you start to see some common themes. You know, if you, if you follow China month by month, year by year, you're always going to be in this state of like alarm and excitement. It's mm. like, this is the greatest crackdown ever. Oh, the internet is creating greater freedom than ever. But I think when you watch it for 10 years, you start to see more overall trends, you know? And so I, I don't think my book really says Chinese internet policy is this way or the other way. It kind of goes through the many fluctuations, but I, I still hold onto the, the main point of the book, which is, you know, the psychological power of the internet in China. And, and, and this idea of, you know, knowing who your comrades are and knowing you're not alone, even in this highly censored environment. And I think, again, Auntie's existence kind of proves that. Mm -hmm. so. Any further questions? Um, this gentleman right here in the middle with the blue shirt. I'm, I'm curious about the breadth of the censorship. When I was in China, I remember I was watching either the BBC or, or CNN or something, and all of a sudden, the TV went black. But, and I thought, is that a power failure? But then I realized the lights were still on. <laughs> and, and, um, and then I figured out what it was, because it happened over and over again. And it had to do with a New York Times article about corruption in the family of the mm -hmm. leadership in China. So is the only thing that's censored the uh, criticism of the government? Uh, or is it much broader than that? Uh, for example, are the Chinese people permitted to see everything that's going on in Syria, in Russia, and so on, and only criticism of their own government is censored, or is it much broader? Mm. Do you want to answer that? Yeah. Interesting I, question. I think the, the, when you talk about Chinese internet, you should always talk about Chinese the, the censorship. You always talk about Chinese self-censorship. Mm -hmm. This is combined together. Actually, it's a, it, it's a tradition education, even through Sima, Sima, Sima Qian, the Shi Ji. I think this self-censorship and censorship thing is thousand years thing. So all the textbook is, is you know, go through through the government principle about how the narrative, the history, is, is nothing about pursue the truth, actually pursue what is good for the government thing. Mm -hmm. So it's not only the Communist Party came into power, they bring up the Soviet new thing. No, it's no Soviet new thing. It's actually a very Chinese tradition thing. So it also came to things like me. Chinese journalists, actually, they are fighters of information, but also they are very good self-censors. We know exactly how to alter the words, censor ourselves, censor ourselves, to make the article pub published. So this is things, so this is daily life. You want to make your voice out, you should do self-censor. Sometimes you even don't know it is it's in your heart, you know the existence of censorship or not, it, whether it is true your heart, or is something you're self-censored, or you're brainwashed. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to do. 
I try very, very hard not to look into the news of Chinese news, only read English newspaper, only read Twitter, to keep my mind clear. But even though without the devil's advocate from Emily Parker and other <laughs> guys, I sometimes if I talk to myself or to talk to Chinese colleagues, I, it just give me one month. I will step slipping to their self interest mm. That's sometimes when I go abroad, it's not only the air is pure, but also the mind is pure. There is no self censor need. But even though the self censorship is kind of a psychology thing, if you talk to the Chinese kids, even they have years of Harvard trend in the United States without any, you know, pressure from the United from China. But they talk about something about Tibet, about about you know how you look at the South China Sea, about even look at the Chinese as a nation, sometimes they will pop up something even they didn't even they understand. So I think this new normal also become the polluted air of thinking. I would argue copycat in China, like the polluted air, it's, it, it's new normal, you can accept that. It's, it's, it, because you know, you know an alternative way. But eventually, we China always be number two. We are the best one to be number two. But I think without freedom of speech, we will never, never be number one. Only when, on, I mean, at only one condition, you are not going crazy. But if the United is going crazy, China is by happen become the number one. Mm. It's not going to, but if you are good, not crazy at all, I think China will be always number two. Why? Because to follow something up is so easy when you have self-censorship. To finish that, but if you want to achieve to lead the world, you definitely need freedom of speech. Mm. Em Emily, um, to his question, Western brands—it's uh, pretty tough going in China right now. Um, but but uh, is censorship in China in terms of Syria, Russia, other events—is it uh, a pretty robust discussion? I don't know, Auntie, you would probably know a little bit more about that. I mean, you've written about those topics, right? I mean, you know, Chinese, right now, what is the, do you feel that there's a, pre, you can find pretty free information about Syria, Russia, other? Yeah. I think the. Relatively, right? Relatively. They just change case by case. Yeah. Sometimes you see more on criticism to Russia because the Chinese government wants Well, I would something. imagine that Ukraine was probably quite sensitive, right? I, I think even Ukraine is not, of, I think, in a neutral. But sometimes you see a lot of criticism. So I, I think it's, a, it's, very, it's very critical. If, for example, I just give a very simple example, North Korea. Mm -hmm. I, 20 years ago, North Korea, you never cannot, you, you cannot criticize North Korea. But North Korea, North Korea now is like a safe target for everyone to criticize, to joke, mm -hmm. at, joke at about. So this is a change because China sometimes become the normal membership of the international community they also change their, the, the, the minds. And the, the minds change the censorship, the censorship change the self-censorship. Mm -hmm. So I would say, because of the internet and the market, Chinese people get more and more normal, but without really freedom, we cannot lead the world as you expect it. So don't be afraid of China. We are always number two. <laughs> one last, uh, room for one last question. Um, the gentleman in the black shirt. Uh, Michael, when you're in China, you figured out how to navigate the, your, your own censorship so you stay out of trouble. When you travel abroad uh, and you talk like you are today, uh, does that worry you? Does what you say here, can it trickle back? Is the government trying to follow you uh, as you leave the country? What, what, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think it's, it's self censorship is, is, is something. You want to be a good guy in China. So you want to be a good guy in China, self-censorship is very important, right? You should keep it aligned with the government. I think very moderate, not very extreme, but sometime it's the time for you to speak up. Just do that because you are a man, right? Mm. Because, because sometimes it's like a historical record. Chinese is very love, it's loving. Chinese people love the history. Sometimes we cannot, we, we don't know the result of these battles. We may lose every battle in matters of freedom, but always we think we are eventually win the war of the freedom. Because we think if you stand on the freedom side, you stand on the 
the right side of history is only a matter of time. You can wait something happen. So when I always self-censor myself, I'm a very good citizen in China, but sometimes you need me to make a little bit cross-line mm. statement, I will do that. With a little bit exciting thing, because it's just like a, do some, you know, it's, little, it's just exciting. And it's necessary, because it's very important for the whole world to understand the complicity and the Chinese people is facing is not black and white thing. Even you guys living in Beijing for more than one month, you totally understand. It's so hard for us to behave here, to pursue the freedom of speech. Uh, we have time for one very last question. I know there was one back there. Um, if you could make it quick, I'd appreciate it. Um, my name is Wei Chen. I, um, actually, I'm an immigrant from China. Yeah. Uh, seven, uh, eight years ago. So I have a question about um, what does United States or the uh, United States business play the role in Chinese democracy? The reason why I ask this question, I don't think so. The freedom of speech is one of the thing um, is a bigger concern. I think it's about Chinese uh, democracy, right? And the uh, freedom of speech is the beginning of the Chinese democracy. So I, I will ask, you know, what does United States and business play in the Chinese democracy? And positive, negative, why? Thank you. Emily, you, you want first? to take that? You first. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a huge uh, question. Yeah, yeah, that is a huge question. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I think you could make the argument that, um, you know, U.S. companies, U.S. businesses are, you know, at least, this is the argument that U.S. businesses make, right, that they are at least, like, expanding the marketplace of ideas, right? Even if they are making compromises and even if they are not perfect, they are at least offering, you know, that's sort of what Google said before they left. They said, well, more news is good news, right? It's better for us to be here than not to be here at all. And I think like, you know, even though the whole market argument is sometimes overstated, there is an argument to be made that like market forces and just the fact that there's so much intense competition in the media in China does help create freedom of speech for the simple reason that people don't want boring news and they don't want to pay for boring news. So the intense competition that you're seeing in media is creating a little bit more space in China. That's not quite the same thing as democracy. I mean, Auntie, I know we're running out of time, but I think this is actually a really interesting question that you're asking because it's very controversial, you know, especially after Snowden. You know, what is the U.S. role here, right? I mean, I've heard both sides of it. Some people say, well, no matter what, the U.S. still has an obligation to criticize China's human rights record, to make a point, to try to advance democracy. And then other people say, well, that's not really a accomplishing anything. It just makes China mad and it makes the U.S. look hypocritical. So I will leave it to Auntie to answer that question. Yeah, <laughs> you are so bad about this. <laughs> I, I think, it, as just mentioned, internet, market and the internet is the only two best thing for China. It's not the anger, of course. They have the pro and the cons. You also have the corruption. You have the princeling to own a lot of money about. You have the, in, the income gap because of that. You have not a pollution, you have the, the climate mm -hmm. disaster, climate disaster thing. But even though I will say it's compare, after all the comparison, I will say is the two best thing to China. I think what role the US and company, US government and company and the citizen should play in the role, I think it's almost like the Cold War. I think Cold War, it's not, now internet Cold War happened. So how can you behave as a United States, U.S. citizen in the Cold War? It's just fight the Soviet Union? No. You should march to D.C. That's the best thing. You have the, the civil rights movement. That's the best thing ever happened because that's kind of moral standard. Right. It really can, you know, it's like soft power to let the Chinese you win the hearts and the minds of Chinese. Even I know your government is not good either, and your company is also a disaster, but if you can just work together with the freedom fighters in China, you fight against your own government, your own corruption, your moral standard were really amazing because we love the United States, not because you have more money. I think eventually we also have money, right? But we love you because you, are, you was Andrew. Even you are not Andrew anymore, but in your heart, you are Andrew heart. Some, sometime in, your, in the part of the, your body. We should pursue the Andrew part of yourself. 
And you, if you have the moral standard, for right. example, just recently, it's very exciting news, I, also controversial about the, 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 the ruling, historical ruling about the gay marriage mm -hmm. thing. You know, the, I think the biggest debate is not in the United States, it's in China. Wow, all my, everyone else talk about the, the terrorism, our country terrorism in, China, in, the, mm -hmm. in the Europe. But in China, everyone is talking about the Supreme Court judge. We debate and fight against that. It's almost like a Supreme Court of the United States, like Chinese Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we always think United States is the moral standard. If you fear, our heart also falling down with you. Auntie and Emily, thank you so much for a most provocative and memorable <laughs> session.